guys, and welcome back to the Brando and Joe podcast. Our guest for today's episode is Jordan Baker. She received her master's in IO psychology from the University of Detroit Mercy, has experience in org development, talent management, DEI, and currently works as a product owner for JB Hunt Transport Services. Welcome, Jordan. Thanks for coming on today. Yeah. I'm super excited for this episode. Yeah, same. <laughs> we looked over um, with every pe- person we do, we like kind of look at their LinkedIn and like do like a deep dive. And I was like, oh my God, we have to have Jordan on. She seems so cool. <laughs> um, but obviously from looking at your LinkedIn, it seems like you had a whole bunch of cool positions, um, like we just said in the bio. Uh, my first question when I was looking at it was, were there any like transferable skills you had when you went from maybe talent management to org development? Because I feel like as IO students, we hear these like job titles thrown around a lot. Um, and I was wondering if when you like transition to these positions, like how similar they were, or were they like very different? Um, like kind of like what the context was. Yeah. I mean, they definitely had their differences, but uh, as far as transferable skills uh, with like talent management and organizational development, a lot of that is really kind of having that um, people centered mindset. Right. And, and knowing how to talk with stakeholders, knowing how to um, deal with ambiguity, um, really being able to kind of take something of a concept and put it into a way where you can talk to people. Um, so for talent management, we did a lot with core competency. So building out skill sets for um, the company. And so what we did is I worked with the finance um, team of the family of companies. And so I would talk with them about what skills are needed, um, how to build those out, how um, a team member can go from somewhere more of like an associate to that senior level, like what skills are needed there. Um, in organizational development, I did more um, onboarding, training and development, um, DEI work. And again, those were really centered around being able to talk to people and understanding people and what their needs are. Um, and so that's kind of how those uh, skills transferred over between uh, roles. So we just had uh, one of our guests, Larry Kravitz, on the show and he was talking about his role in organizational development. Uh, It's interesting because you mentioned like three different areas that you kind of worked in in organizational development. Mm -hmm. Could you, for our listeners, break those down a little bit and talk about the type of work that you did and how you kind of balanced that with all those different roles? Yeah, I I guess the first thing I would say is that it depends on the company and what they need, right? So when I worked um, at a bigger organization, they had a lot of things already built out. So they had training plans. They um, knew what they wanted to put as far as um, every company is different. And so when I was at the bigger company, I was more so focusing on um, building relationships with um, the family of companies. And so there are a lot of different companies within the bigger organization. And so I worked with them to kind of um, figure out where the skills were where are those skills that um, can be transparent for employees, right? So let's say I'm coming into a company and I want to be a talent management consultant. However, I don't know how I can be successful in a talent management role. And so I'm saying, well, to my manager, how can I get to a senior level? And my manager may not know. They may not know how to communicate that. They may not know how to say, hey, you need to be able to have strong communication. You need to have um, analytic skills. Um, And so that's kind of what we did in the bigger organization. And when I worked at a smaller company, which was a startup, they didn't have anything built out. And so what I was really doing was creating those training programs, creating core competency skills, talking to leaders and helping coach them to develop their own team. Um, in a sense. So it really depends on what the need is of that company. And I think that's why I loved working in different roles um, and at different companies, because working at a big company versus working at a small company is totally different. Um, At a small company, you get much more responsibility and you can create things um, and do it by yourself. But then in the same sense, you don't really have that team. It's probably going to be you and maybe one other person, and it's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be really fulfilling. So I hope that answered the question for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, You kind of took my question right out of my mouth about the bigger versus smaller companies. But I guess a follow-up question could be, um, do the core competencies stay the same 
in similar roles versus a big company and a small company? Because I guess objectively, like maybe the, the role is the same, whether it's like a, a talent management role, but at a smaller company, maybe do they have to take more on and that changes the competencies that you have to train them on? Yeah. And it depends on, again, like what field um, the company is in, right? So when I worked at the startup, it was um, for marshmallows. They created their own marshmallows that had like chocolate inside. It was crazy, but it, it had a lot to do with manufacturing. Um, and so those core competencies are probably going to be different than someone who works um, at a mortgage industry um, and the whole family of companies. And so that was over 20,000 um, team members for a, such a smaller scale. So I would say yes, and it also depends on the values of the company. So the way that we developed ours was, this was developed before me, before I became a talent management consultant, but they said, hey, every employee needs these core competency skills. And then every employee, depending on where they work, also need role competencies. And so, yes, the core competencies were the baseline for all employees, but then we also had a few role competencies that was specific to the position that that team member was in. Uh, so that's... That's really cool. Like I know Joe and I have been working with competencies in some of the uh, projects we're doing in our research class and our selection class and just trying to like, what well, was actually a project that they did together. But um, I want to hear a little bit about uh, some of those we were talking about earlier, those transferable skills. So when you were at like the University of Detroit Mercy and then you started and entered the workforce, um, what did the program do for you? Like how much of it was that learning on the job training almost versus what you learned in your program for those prospective students out there who are trying to get involved in these careers? Yeah, so that's that's like a really good question, right? Because when I first graduated, um, my team, when I started working at uh, my first company, a lot of them were actually IO psychology students who had either just graduated or were going to graduate. And so... Um, I was at Detroit Mercy, but then there were a lot of my colleagues who went to Wayne State for their master's um, in IO psychology. And so I remember one of the um, senior consultants, I chatted with her and she said, hey, when you start off in this position, do not think it's going to be right exactly by the book and what you learned in, in grad school, right? And she was like, that's going to frustrate you because in the real world, things are different. And they, it doesn't just go by the book. It depends on the culture of the company. It depends on who your leader is. It depends on what their vision is. So don't always go right by the book um, and what they taught you in school. Like, yes, that is a great starting point, but it's going to depend again, like what that company needs and how mature they are as a company. So again, if they're just starting out, you may have to put in a lot more work or they may not be able to get to the level that you see or that you learned in school. It's going to take much more time. And so I think that was one of the biggest pieces of advice that I got from one of the senior consultants that really changed my aspect, like the aspect of how I felt going into corporate America, um, especially being fresh out of a grad school, you know, and people, of course, who are in IELTS psychology are really passionate about making changes in the organization and bettering the organization. And, you can really burn yourself out um, if you go right in there and say, well, I learned this in school and this is what I'm supposed to do. And this is what we have to do. Um, it takes much more time and a, a lot more willpower for sure. It's nice that you said you were able to work with like IO psychologists right out of yeah. grad school. I feel like everyone Brandon and I talked to, they're like, I was the only IO psychologist that I had tried to like talk to them about this thing that we learned. And they're like, what is that? Like, and you're like, Oh, I learned about it. Um, have you, did you see that follow through in your other positions or later on when you worked at other companies, you're like, oh, I am the only IO psychologist? I would say when I worked at um, my first company, it was um, a huge company and there was maybe five of us who were all in IO and we're all within the same teams or we worked together. Um, and at, I would say at the smaller companies, I was the only person who was in IO um, and a lot of people didn't know what that was, right? Didn't know what the field was. And I kind of had to explain to them and they thought it was very needed, although they didn't know <laughs> too much about, you know, what IO psychologists do. Um, you know, they were like, Hey, this, this sounds cool. And I'm excited to have you on the team because this is very valuable. So. And so they all saw that value and it kind of 
reinforces i whenever i hear that it always personally for me reinforces the the desire to join io psychology uh, i was wondering for you like where did that when you first started in io and like obviously we, we've seen you you went and done a bunch of different roles like was there a specific role that you had in mind coming out of grad school or was it kind of just you wanted to get a, a taste of everything and give it all a shot yeah well it was so crazy right because um, when I was younger, before I even went to college, I knew I wanted to go into psychology. Um, and I thought I wanted to be like a clinical psychologist for the longest time or a counseling psychologist. And as I got older, I was like, you know what? I'm a little sensitive <laughs> when it comes to counseling other people. It's a, you know, a lot of emotional toll. And so I was like, well, I really want to help people, but how can I do that where I can, um, do something outside of counseling, but still in psychology. And that's kind of how I found, I did some research and found there was a field called IO psychology. Um, and yeah, I, I knew I wanted to go into IO psychology. I thought I wanted to go into leadership development, um, but starting out, most people don't really jump right into career, you know, coaching or leadership development as soon as they graduate grad school. So I said, let me kind of figure out how the organization um, works and how to make the organization more effective. Um, and so I got an internship at the company that um, I was first at. And it was great. It was more of like project management, but I was able to shadow areas that I enjoyed. So I shadowed a change management team. I shadowed the talent management team, the organizational development team. And I liked all of them. <laughs> and so I had to choose one. And of course I said, maybe it will be great if I can go into organizational development first. And so I started there. I did a lot with um, surveys. Um, I managed um, the survey platform um, and we analyzed that data, presented that to stakeholders, senior leaders. And I really loved that. I enjoyed it. Um, and then I wanted to kind of work more with the skill sets of um, employees and team members. And really um, how I got into that was I remember being on the team and I chatted with some of my coworkers and they said, I just want to know how I can get to a senior. I want to know how I can get from, you know, junior to associate. I want to know how I can move up, but there's no skills that my leader tells me on how I can actually get there. There's no path. Um, and so that's what made me want to go into talent management is that I wanted to help people have a path on where they could go next. And so, you know, from there, I decided to go and be a talent management consultant. And then after that, I loved it but I wanted to now take this to a smaller company. I wanted to see what it was like taking all this knowledge that I got from working at a Fortune 500 company, um, a mature company, and, and take it to a small company where they don't even know what IO psychology is. They don't really have someone who can train them or do leadership development. And that's kind of what I did. So I hopped around and um, you know, brought some knowledge every, every time I, I left and went somewhere new. You're definitely not alone in the fact of your IO psychology route. I know sometimes you're like, oh, I had a unique experience getting to IO. And you're like, everyone else wanted to go into school or clinical or counseling. And then you're like, oh, now I'm here at IO. Yeah. But you pointed out a cool part of your internship about shadowing different areas of the company. And I know that we're at the time in our IO career where a lot of students are starting to apply for internships or either currently in one. Um, and I know, I mean, in my... Uh, own life too. I was thinking like, oh, if I get an internship in just this field, am I only going to be doing this, which is still cool, but I know there's like a whole bunch of different other parts of the company that I'd like to like take part in. Um, is the shadowing part of the different uh, facets in the company, is that something you had to like ask for, or is it like part of the internship? How did that process go? Yeah. So it's definitely something that I had to ask for, but just the culture at, at where I worked um, first they're, they do so much shadowing. They want you to grow. They want, you know, to be able to say, hey, I love what I currently do, but I want to see if I'm more passionate about this. And so I would definitely say it depends on the company that you work for um, and how their, how their culture is. Um, and I know I, I had open conversations with my leader and my manager, and I trusted her a lot. And she knew that I was an IO psychology and I told her my interests, you know, during our one-on-ones, I was very transparent about that. And she was like, you know what? I'm fine with you shadowing other, you know, other areas of the business. I'm an advocate for you and I want you to go where you're passionate. And so 
she said her as a leader, she would, you know, reach out and send an email to the leader on the change management team or the talent management team and say, hey, I have um, an intern, Jordan, she's here. She's um, in IO psychology. She's really interested in possibly pursuing change management or talent management. Is there any way she could shout out your team for a week? Or is there any projects that she could work on for you um, in her free time? And so that's kind of how I got about um, moving within the company and really kind of going into those different roles um, while I was an intern. Seems like a really cool intern experience. Yeah. I'm hoping we have uh, the same ones. <laughs> um, is there a certain process that you went, because you, it's, I mean, the marshmallow company sounds, I forgot the name of it off the top of my head, but that sounds like so cool. Yeah. Was, that wasn't the place you interned for, was it? Or was no, it, was I uh, interned company? at Quicken Loans. It's now called Rocket Mortgage. Yep, that's where yes. I was first. Okay. <laughs> Okay. That's really like, honestly, all of that experience has to be so amazing. And now like taking that and kind of pushing it more into what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, so like we, we talked about the talent management aspect and the DEI aspect and the organizational development. Uh, when you kind of look at it and make it almost come full circle, what parts of that are you taking into your role now uh, at your new company that you're working for? Yeah. So the new company that I work for, um, which is JB Hunt, I am always just loving to acquire knowledge. Um, and I like to take a lot of what I learned and apply it no matter what role, you know, in real life, in corporate America, um, in personal life. And so really, again, having that understanding of people, of um, knowing that people want to grow and want to, you know, have a great experience where they work. Um, is really what helps me transfer those skills. Um, as a product owner, our responsibility is kind of like to develop and communicate the product goal. Um, and in order to do that, you really need to know how to talk to your stakeholders, right? You have to know how to engage with them. You have to know what their wants are, what their needs are. Um, and again, that's the biggest skill that I feel like I've acquired throughout all these different roles is if you can connect with people and you can know what it is that they want and need, it's much easier to build that rapport and, and get to the end goal. And so that's the biggest thing. And your, your current role at this company is, is the title a product owner? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I tried to do a little bit of research, but I was, I think I was getting a little mixed up. Are you able to kind of just tell us a little bit about like what it means to be a product owner? Yeah, sure. So I guess I'll start by saying I um, started out at the company as um, a change manager. Um, and so that one, what we do is kind of create and promote, you know, the change vision or develop a plan of change. But as the product owner, we um, own a product and that product can depend on what company you're working for um, and, and what that product is. Sometimes it can be a physical product. It could be, um, you know, our product online that they have, an app. Um, and so I work with the product and my goal really is to kind of, again, communicate that goal and the vision of what that product is. And so what we do is we um, have backlog items. I'm trying to say this in like simplest terms, but we have items that we need um, in order for a product to be created. And so I manage what we call the backlog. So any items, um, stories um, that developers need to create that. And I'm kind of that middle person between the developers and the business. So let's say the, the businesses they, we have, let's say we have an app and the business says, well, I want to create this functionality uh, within the product. Can we do that? My goal is to go to the developers and the software engineers and say, hey, this is what the business wants. This is what the users want to improve this app or this product. Can we do this? And the developers say, yeah, we could do this. It may take three months or six months, but we can build this product out. So I go back to the business and say, hey, we can do this, but it may take three months or it may take six months. And if that's what they want, then we decide to proceed with that. And I'm, you know, that that middleman between um, the developers and the business to really create the vision um, and create a successful product. That's a really cool role. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I I like hearing about that middleman role that you play for those who, for those companies and or for that company and for that product. Um, with that being said, 
what part of that uh, is the IO aspect of it? Because I feel like you're you're managing so many people and so many personalities, you can really pull in a lot of different IO stuff. Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear like the stuff that you use on a day to day basis. Yeah, I mean, I would say leadership development is one for sure, right? Because we want to be able to have these conversations where people feel like they have the autonomy to complete the work, um, to grow within, you know, if they're a developer, um, being creative and saying, hey, this is like an idea that I have. And me being able to say, go do it. If, if this is what's going to make the product better, go do that. Like, let's have a conversation on, you know, what we need to make this happen. And maybe the business would like it. Um, again, also stakeholder engagement. That's like the biggest thing that I always say is I'm talking to the business and I have to deliver bad news. Um, It may not be great to hear, but let me tell the business how this is going to affect the product and what we can kind of do to um, continue to to move forward with the product, make it the best it can be. Um, And if I have to get backlash, you know, that's fine. I'll be able to have those crucial conversations, those hard conversations in order to get the product down down the line. And then also communication, um, communicating to the users what it is that we are developing, how it's going to impact them, how it's going to be beneficial. Because the biggest thing that people want to know is, how is this going to benefit me? How is this going to make my life easier? So being able to have those communication skills where we may develop emails or trainings and send those out, again, like knowing the needs of the users and how it's going to benefit them. I would say, um, I think when people, when people think of IO, sometimes they may think of just data analytics or just organizational development or whatever it is that they have their mind set on. Right. But IO psychology is more than that. You can take any skills that you have within those roles and apply it to a lot of roles, right? Anything that's, that's going to deal with people, you can apply IO psychology to. Let's just be honest. If you know how to talk to people, if you know how to improve their life and what they want, then you're using those IO skills. And and people think sometimes those soft skills are not as valuable, and it is so valuable. There are a lot of things that you can get training on um, and that you can learn, but being able to understand people and being able to have empathy and, and know how to... Um, navigate crucial conversations, tough conversations is going to take you way further than, you know, just a degree or, or having a certain training. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Especially when you brought up that point about talking to stakeholders, mm-hmm. I feel like a growing theme in IO is when, whether we hearing it on like a presentation is like being able to communicate with leaders or executive boards um, or stakeholders. If it's like data you're talking about, or it's like the message you're trying to get across um, that it's like an actual skill that you have to learn. It's not as easy as some people may think. Yeah. Is there a certain way you developed the skills needed to talk to stakeholders to kind of get your message across? Yeah, I. that's such a good question because um, when I first graduated from grad school, um, I thought I knew how to speak to, to stakeholders, you know? Um, sometimes <laughs> we're at the level, we're like, ooh, we're IO psychology practitioners. We already know everything. And I got into the real world. And I remember the first time that I had to speak to a stakeholder, I was so stunned. I didn't know how to give bad news. I didn't know how to deal with ambiguity. I didn't know how to um, just sort of navigate conversations as they came. Um, and what really helped me is having a mentor. Um, that is the biggest thing. I know as soon as I graduated, and even during my grad program, I would look on LinkedIn and spend so much time finding someone that was in a position that I wanted to be, whether it was a change manager, whether it was an organizational development manager, whether it was a DEI manager, anybody that I thought I would be interested in, I would reach out to them. And I would say, hey, like my name is Jordan. I'm an IO psychology student, and I'm really interested in change management can I just talk to you and and pick your brain and just ask you how you got to this role? And most of the time people would say, yeah, sometimes people wouldn't respond and, you know, take, you know, it's it's like, whatever, I'll just find, you know, continue on and won't stop. And there were a few great people who took time um, out of their busy schedules to just chat with me. And I would say, how do you deal with stakeholders? How did you have like these tough conversations? What did you do 
that I can implement faster, right? I think a lot of times some people don't really understand the value of mentorship and they think they can do it on their own. And sure, that's fine. You can try and do it on your own. You, you may think you don't need anybody, but if you want to get there faster, find somebody who's already done it, you know, find somebody who can get you there quicker so you don't have to make the same mistakes that they have done before. You know, you keep bringing up this topic, Jordan, of difficult conversations or hard conversations. And I wanted to take a second and hone in on that for a second, because I feel like that is something in IO that I know Joe and I haven't really talked about it too much, but I've been personally learning about it a little bit more. And uh, and I just kind of want to hear about the role that you've seen IO play in that. I've seen a lot of like coaching techniques be something that play a big role in difficult conversations and mm-hmm. just that open communication and making sure that you're keeping key stakeholders involved and and all of that. But I would love to hear like your your view on like navigating those difficult conversations as somebody, especially like when you were fresh out of grad school? Yeah, I would say a few instances that I can think of is change management. I love change management. There was always going to be pushback because there are going to be people who are resistant to change. And I think that was like my biggest, wow, I need to know how to navigate this, right? Because it's one thing to say, throw out an email of communication, say, hey, this change is coming or this product is coming. But it's another thing for people to give you that feedback and say, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. And you're like, wait, okay, how do I respond back to that, right? Um, and so I would say just some of the the key things that I've learned, and, and I'm no expert yet, you know, I'm still learning, continuously learning, but I would say, again, figure out what they want um, and empathize with them. And you you understand that change is not easy. Change is going to be difficult. But in order to communicate with them, you have to figure out what it is that you can do to make their life easier. And so if there's a big change coming, you may say, I I know this change may not be easy. However, these are things that we have to help you go through this change. We have training, online training. We have FAQs and resources. We have um, office hours where you can meet with the team and you can ask them questions. We're going to hold focus groups where you can you know, voice your opinions or concerns about a product or a change coming. And I think the biggest way to kind of mitigate that risk of um, people being unhappy or not liking change is giving them a voice and giving them the opportunity to um, talk about their concerns. The biggest thing I know during COVID when I um, worked at Quicken Loans and and now Rocket Mortgage, um, we would send out a survey to all of our team members and say, hey, We know this is a difficult time during the pandemic. What can we do to help improve your experience while you guys are working from home or while we transition back into the office? And there was a lot of people who will respond and say, we need childcare or we need work from home equipment and and we need Wi-Fi, whatever that is. And I remember what really made me passionate, especially when I was an organizational development analyst working on these surveys and talking to team members is that we would take those insights and put action behind it. And so I remember we ended up giving like a discount to parents who needed childcare. We would give away our old desks that we had in the office. And I remember I got like a huge uh, sit stand desk and they just gave it away. They were like, come pick it up for free. And so again, it kind of depends on the company and their culture and them saying, Hey, we actually care, you know? So with these conversations, whatever it is that they have to say, we want to actually have action behind them and make it beneficial for them. So I know that was long winded, but I hope that answered your your question there. hundred percent. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's so nice to hear how passionate you are about the IO work because yeah. in its whole IO work is really helping people using mm-hmm. a variety of methods. Um, and I know we probably covered a whole bunch of different topics over this podcast. Um, and, and we, this might be repetitive, but I want to hear how we like to end our episodes is just like general advice you can give to IO students or prospective IO students um, on how they could just succeed in the field um, or just next steps that they can take to further their own career. Yeah, I guess like some advice that I would give is always be open to feedback. Um, allow people to give you negative feedback, like allow them to really get to the nitty gritty of what can you improve on and how you can get there the quickest. Um, One thing that I would always do with my leaders and 
even my team members when I was first um, starting out and first graduated, I would say like, what can I work on? Um, let's, if I'm in this meeting with stakeholders, what did it, what did you see that you could say, all right, Jordan may need to work on this. And they may say nothing. And sometimes they may say, hey, you did great, but you were so nervous and you were speaking so fast. Or, you know, you didn't know how to answer this question. And taking that and say, okay, it's not a negative reflection on me, but this is something that I can work on. Um, and get feedback fast, as, as quick as you can, because the quicker you can get feedback, um, the quicker you can improve. Um, and I would also say another piece of advice is network. Network with people who are like-minded. Um, network with people who are IO professionals, who are in, again, spaces that you want to be in, that you aren't there yet, but then also giving back. So as soon as you get to the next level and the next level, make sure that you're helping other fellow IO um, professionals move in their careers and, in, you know, improve in their careers and help them. I think that's one of the biggest things that I find beneficial is that you learn from people and you learn from people who are different, but then also similar. Um, and so you get a lot of different perspectives um, and you learn a lot, right? Because different companies do different things. And so talking to someone who um, works in the oil and gas industry versus someone who works in the mortgage industry versus manufacturing, they all have different techniques that each of us can learn from each other in that way. So just to sum that up, I would say get feedback as fast as you can for feedback from people who um, you trust and are, you know, mentors to you or people that you think are going to give you good feedback. Also find a mentor and network and also just be open to learning. I guess those would be the things I would say. I don't think we've had the feedback word yet. And that's, it's such great advice. Um, really is. I don't, it can be, you're right. It can be hard to receive feedback but if you can kind of put that like positive spin on it instead of something that I did bad, but something I can work on, it can be super beneficial to just your overall career. Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. I think that that's something that our listeners can definitely take back with them and build off of. I know we always try to keep the little tidbits of information that people give us here at the end of our episodes. Um, but Jordan, thank you so much for your time today. Like we really appreciate you coming on here with us and, spending some time with us talking about your amazing working career. So thank you so much for joining and giving us all that great information too. And all of our listeners out there. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys for having me. This was so fun. <laughs> thank you. Take care. All right. Bye. So that was a great episode with Jordan. She really has gotten a lot of great experience and I feel like I got to learn a lot just hearing her talk about the different roles she's been in. She did such a great job at giving us a really good surface level view of the work she's done. Uh, what do you think, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is going to be a great episode for prospective students to watch and kind of just learn about the different positions that are out there. And honestly, how easy it is to have one sort of position and then move to another. And there are some similar skills, but there are some different tasks uh, and it's just nice to know that like you're kind of not pigeonholed into one sp specific thing. There's a lot of different things you could do in the field of IO. Yeah, I, we touch on it a couple times, like not being pigeonholed in the field. But this is like a person who gives us a perfect example of that. Like we, we see somebody who jumped from so many different things and got to try out so much stuff. And honestly, the great part about it is in IO, everybody's here to help each other. So like... With her experience with interning and getting some exposure to a role and getting to shadow and getting to see different things like that's great and try to surround yourselves with ios around you and they can help you and help you find spots in your career that you might be interested in yeah no absolutely but uh thank you again for everybody watching and uh we'll see you at the next episode see you guys